This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have an extraordinary, talented guest on the phone with me this evening. Yes, he is... uh, one of the screenwriters, I believe co-screenwriters on Jaws, also The Jerk, in a movie that um, I was tickled by growing up that he also directed called Caveman with Ringo Starr, which I'm definitely going to dive into in a little more detail here. I got the wonderfully talented Carl Gottlieb on the phone with me. How do you do, Car- uh, Carl? How Excuse are you, me. Greg? I'm doing fantastic. Good. Wow. I, I, I'm... Uh, it's such an honor that um, uh, Steve Joyner was able to hook us up because l- last year, like, I, I did uh, I did 20 interviews in 2015, and I did 48 last year, and and I was actually looking for somebody to come on and talk about Caveman last year for its 35th anniversary, and uh, I couldn't locate anybody. So when Steve Joyner told me he, he was uh, uh, had connections with you, I was like, ah, oh, get me in touch with Carl. <laughs> Yeah, that worked out. Uh, that worked out well. Steve's, uh, Steve's a big fan. Yeah. Well, how do you how do you know Steve? Did he connect with he you? He approached me online, uh, and and uh, uh, he had uh, a, a different interview show that uh, uh, that he wanted to hook me up with, and I did that interview for him. And you know, then he he keeps calling and re- reminding me of these opportunities so whenever he does i'm happy to hear from him yes and we're happy to hear from you as well steve uh i think uh connected with me on facebook i i interviewed a an actress he was uh, affiliated with and uh he connected with me and uh i was kind of noticing stuff he was doing online and i thought i should see what steve joiner is all about and he was my first guest of 2017 and led me to all these amazing uh people that he's entrusted with me and and uh, he's liked what I've I've done, so uh, and I'm more than happy to promote these people. So in, in the digital era, we we need the, this uh, kind of uh, you know, informal networking that gets done, uh, you know, literally person to person, but eventually it winds up connecting uh, people like me with uh, an audience out there and. You, your listeners and uh, your subscribers, and I would never normally get a chance to reach out to them. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a creature of the internet, although I probably spend too much time online, like everyone else. Uh, and these kind of shows, you know, open the door to a lot of interested people. Hmm. I just wondering uh, before we dive into your films, uh, if you just give us a little brief background, uh, you know, uh, your your upbringing and how you uh, got into film. Well, I was I was born and raised in New York City in Manhattan. I went to school on the subway every day uh, when I went to high school, and then I went to City College in New York for a couple of years, and then I got bored with taking public transportation to higher education. And I wanted to experience college life the way I had seen it in fiction, you know, with fraternities and football games and, you know, tree-lined campuses. And, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't have that in metropolitan New York. Uh, and I, I had a scholarship that uh, enabled me to work my way through the last two years of college at Syracuse University, where I went to the journalism school, which is a very good one, and also discovered the theater and drama department got a dual major, theater and journalism, figured I'd be a, a critic or playwright. And then I, I, I uh, drifted around doing the usual beginner's showbiz jobs. I hung lights and did sound in coffee houses in Greenwich Village, and I worked in little off, off, off Broadway theaters uh, as a stage manager. Uh, and then to uh, make a long story short, a, a very good friend of mine from college went to work at Second City in Chicago and then went to open the committee in San Francisco, which was one of the earliest iterations of satirical improvisation. And uh, I went to visit him, and 
they needed a stage manager, and they offered me a job, and I started a stage manager at the committee, and I graduated to a director, and I was, uh, then I went to New York to, for, uh, I went back to the city for a year or so, and then came back as an actor, and then as an actor, uh, our company did very well, and we went to Los Angeles to open a new theater there, and in Los Angeles, I was spotted by the Smothers Brothers, who were putting together their writing staff, and, and uh, they were looking for new, young, funny people. And I came to their attention. They hired me, and they hired Steve Martin, and they hired Rob Reiner, and they hired uh, Bob Einstein, and a songwriter named John Hartford. And we all went to work and got our Writers Guild cards on that show back in 1960. And then I was writing comedy variety television, and I, you know, I went through a bunch of jobs, and uh, I was writing The Odd Couple, the old uh, Tony Randall, Jack Klugman series on ABC, when I got a call from a friend uh, named Steven Spielberg. We had uh, the same agent, and we used to go out looking to sell scripts together. Uh, we we could never get hired because Stephen was locked in to direct, and nobody wanted to take chance on a new director. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then then but, but in the meantime he did uh, he he was making a reputation as a television director, and then he got a, a, his first feature film, and he came back from that and wanted to do another feature, and the script for Jaws came to his attention, and he asked me to be in it as an actor and asked me what I thought about the script. I told him that I thought it was not a very good script, and he agreed. Uh, so he said, introduced me to the producers, and I gave them my ideas, and they said, well, can you start tomorrow? Because we're shooting this movie in three weeks. So I was hired first as an actor to be in Jaws, and then I was hired to do the rewrite while I was acting. And that opened the door to that movie and the screenwriting and the, the rest of my career. So. One thing led to another, as it always does in show business. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask you about um, Jaws and the jerk momentarily, but I tell you what, I, I, I don't think you get talk, to talk about Caveman enough. Don't often get to talk about it, that's right. And um, I got to tell you, I saw that the drive-in when I was young. We don't have drive-ins here anymore, but I remember Caveman really, really well. Now, now I thought the jerk is easily, in my opinion, Steve Martin's funniest movie. And you bring a lot of that same comedic wit to Caveman now. Um, and I've actually met people that didn't like the film because there was no English in it. And I'm like, yeah, but it's so simple to understand. And I'm, you're talking to a guy who's never passed a French class in his life. I couldn't take pass anything outside an English class, and yet I could understand the film. And s sure. some people just, just flew over their heads. I, you know, I, I, never, I could never understand that. But, you know, I, I, and curiously enough, the, the, the film uh, was a huge hit in, uh, in Europe. It ran in Germany for months and months and months because, uh, you know, it's the, the humor is physical and kind of easy to understand. You don't have to speak English to enjoy it. No. Nope. Just, uh, just Evan Kim spoke English. He, he was the only one. Yeah. And, and uh, we reserved that for a special occasion. And uh, I, so I suppose, you know, they, they dubbed those 11 words in English into German. And, but, you know, uh, the the film has has had a, a nice career, and I I'm 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 very fond of it. Tell me, do you think a toque is still a loon to Lana, or is it Lana a loon to a toque? <laughs> they are still very much a loon to. <laughs> uh, you know, they they they, uh, they met on my movie, and uh, hooked up, and uh, you know are inseparable, and they've been together ever since. Did you have any ool before this interview? <laughs> 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 you can tell I'm versed in this film. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah we we, <laughs> they, we used to uh, as a uh, kind of a, one of the PR uh, you know like items that we uh, sent out or the studio sent out. We used to send a little a short glossary of, of caveman cave speak. 
Yeah, and you know what? I got to credit you because, you know, I thought your stuff in The Jerk was brilliant. And, but I got to say, to Vave to write a movie like Caveman, and uh, I remember Roger Ebert had panned the movie, and it, he said, you know, he doesn't know uh, the movie. He said the movie, something along the lines, don't quote me on this, uh, but that had nothing to parody, you know? And I And I was like, yeah, but... Look at the fact that you're taking, you're creating a screenplay and you're creating your own language and you're making it simplistic enough that's understandable even for a guy like me who's not the best educated person out there. I just got your basic, you know, high school and even I was able to to get it. And I think it took a lot of thought for you to come up with the language in the film. And and uh, I just wondered how y- you come up with um, like the words and and uh, like ool and uh, alunda and uh, and and stuff like that and like you know puka. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, there's actually a zug zug. Uh, yep, sex. <laughs> which is sex. That's actually a real Tibetan word, zug. It's like a Tibetan verb for for uh, making love. Uh, and a friend of mine who worked on the movie as my assistant had spent time in Nepal and hung out with Tibetans and spoke the language. And, uh, you know, he was the one who suggested, and it sounded, you know, absolutely appropriate. The other words, what we did was, you know, as with any language, uh, whether it's, you know, French or Swahili or Eskimo, uh, you begin with uh, the familiar verbs, you know, to have, to be, to eat, to want, to make love, you know, the basic human activities, Yeah. and uh, names, you know, people name things, the nouns, you know, the personal, the pronouns for, for people, uh, and, you know, proper nouns, and nouns for things, you know, food, fire, water, drink, you know, the, and once we had enough basic vocabulary words, you know, we did what all comedy writers did was you know cast about for funny sounding words that could be strung together and that's how the language evolved now to make the the actors happy and to make it look like a regular screenplay that people could understand when we typed the screenplay we put in you know english language dialogue for the actors uh and use the the parenthetical stage direction you know atuk parentheses as if to say i love you lana okay lana you know atuk olunda lana yeah you know? and in where we didn't have the words you know for slightly more complicated concepts uh and uh, for the character of uh, tanda the john john tusak character mm mm-hmm. mhm uh, we would just type, you know, uh, Tonda, as if to say, come here, you little twerp, I'm going to break your neck. Mm-hmm. And then we would leave it to the actor to go, I'm going to make <laughs> the appropriate sounds. So the actors knew what they were saying all the time, even if they were saying gibberish words. Yep. And I... the result is everybody was clear on what they were saying and doing. And I gotta say, what a great opening! Like I loved it, where it shows the caveman uh, word and rock formation, and the screen shakes, you know, and it, it dissolves into these uh, rocks crumbling. And then you hear the music. I love the music score, you know. <laughs> Lalo Schifrin, he's a great composer. Yeah, that is fantastic, and uh, I remember that music score, and then it, you have this nice shot where you go right in on everybody's feeding on the trees and eating their ool, and of course, nobody wants Ringo Starr as, you know, a toque anywhere near them. He's right. the outcast. He's like the little jinx, the little, little uh, you know, the, the, out, the outsider, normally, you know, the, the runt of the litter. Uh, yeah, and he, and he gets into a funny situation early in the movie. You know, he goes wandering off in his, on his own, and he comes across what looks like these little Venus fly traps that are that are like standing up on end. And he goes to reach for some fruit, and uh, one of them wraps around his legs and around his neck, and one of them <laughs> makes that kissing sound, kisses the side of his face. <laughs> that was a funny sequence. Yeah, you know, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great fun to write. I had a, a, a collaborator on the writer, so that I, I want to 
give him credit while we're talking, is a great comedy writer named Rudy DeLuca. Okay. Who did a lot of work with Mel Brooks uh, on many Mel Brooks films, and including you know, the, uh, the History of the World Part One, uh, in in which uh, he uh, uh, you know, covered some of the same ground. Yeah, another scene too, like like um, <laughs> where Ringo Starr goes to, you know, we. Uh, I guess you could say this is the. The first sign of uh, what they call today slipping a roofie, he puts this, uh, of course, he has this little uh, berries that can put people yeah. to sleep. And the, he the, 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 uh, the ancestor, the prehistoric version of opioid poppies and cannabis blended it all into one. Yeah, and he gives this to, uh, uh, first it fails, because, you know, Lana gives the, the fruit to... Uh, uh, Tonda and Tonda right. eats it. So the right. second time he he to, to fix that, puts them both to sleep. I, I I just I to this day I get a big laugh where they both turn over at the same time, and of course Tonda lets this gigantic fur fart out, and you hear Ringo Starr just let this huge yelp out, and he falls off the bed, and you just see the dust come up flying up over the edge. Yeah. Uh, what, what, how how did you come about casting Ringo Starr? What, what was it like working well, we, with him? We, I, I was working, you know, I had two very uh, very knowledgeable producers, and uh, once we had the you know the, con- the the basic elements of the script, you know, and uh, as a matter of fact, we had the script finished, and we got a green light from the studio to go ahead and shoot it. We got the the next step was to find a cast, and. Uh, we needed a you know kind of a, a actor of, of short stature, but who had some you know star power, and uh, no pun intended. Uh, and uh, there, there weren't you know a lot because most most actors even if they're short people don't want to play small. But, you know they they you know they they want to be seen as as larger than life. But Ringo and Dudley Moore was another candidate for the part. Was Steve Martin ever considered? No, no. At that time, he was. Uh, I think he was already on his. He was. Uh, he was making his own films at that point. He was a, that was after the the Jerk. So he was making films with Carl Reiner. He was making The Man with Two Brains and. Uh, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Okay. Uh, story. He was very busy. So why did you go with well, Ringo put, over Dudley? You put, uh, I think, you know, uh, Ringo read the script and, you know, said he'd like to do it. Okay. And the studio agreed that he would be an appropriate leading man. Well, and, uh, yeah. And get to fill in around him. We found the, you know, Barbara, everybody remembers Barbara Bach because she was a Bond girl and she was beautiful and she became Mrs. Ringo Starr. But the other female lead in the picture is Shelley Long. Yep. Of ten years on Friends, and is a, Cheers. a delicious comedian. Uh, so Shelley Long, and then uh, uh, John Matuzak was a find who knew that a football player could be so funny. Yeah. He really knew how to play comedy. I mean, it's very rare. Uh, and Dennis Quaid, you know, another another leading man type. You know, we it's quite a cast in that movie. I gotta say, Barbara Bach. Uh, she, of course, in the Spy Who Loved Me, James Bond, absolutely gorgeous woman. And I, I have, to, I gotta laugh because, of course, they got married uh, um, after the film, and um, it's kind of funny because that, uh, there's a comes a point in Caveman where he drops her in a big mound of uh, <laughs> shit. Excrement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What was that stuff made out of? He, he uh, she's the bad girl, and he at the very end of the movie he hooks up with the good girl, Shelley Long. <laughs> yeah, what was that stuff made out of? Oh God, you know, you'd have to ask Roy Arbogast, who was a special <laughs> effects gaffer on that movie. He was a genius in making stuff that looked like other stuff. Uh, he he's the guy who built that egg, that giant fried egg. Oh yeah. 
mean, that, that's an that amazing... Carl Lumley kind of uh, took a bath in accidentally. Yeah, you know, Carl Lumley stabs it. I mean, it had a yolk and a white, and then the yolk broke like a real egg yolk. It was, mm-hmm. you know, kind of amazing. Uh, but to answer your specific question about the, the pile of shit, uh, he just fabricated that out of, you know, water and fuller's earth and flour and some sort of plastic compound. I have no idea. It was, but it worked. How did Bert? And, huh? and it cleaned up quickly. That was the important thing, because if you have to do take two, you can't, you know, you can't have something that that uh, is really messy. How did Barbara Bach feel about doing that scene? Well, you know, it was. It, she was the, you know, one of the stars of the movie, and that and that moment was in the script. She knew that sooner or later she'd be dropped. <laughs> what was she like to work with? Well, she was a she was a pleasure. You know, she, she was a. Uh, she was, you know, looking to break that uh, mold. You know, all James Bond girls, the Bond girls, yeah. they used to be called. Um, basically, if you were a Bond girl, you could maybe do another couple of pictures as a femme fatale, and then. You'd marry an Italian industrialist or an American billionaire, and you know you you you'd, if you were lucky, you'd wind up Melania Trump. Okay. And and she didn't want to do that. She was she was more interested in playing a range of characters, and the idea of doing a comedy appealed to her. Awesome. And uh, she met Ringo when when we started filming the movie. I had a a party for the cast in my house in Los Angeles before we all packed up and moved to Mexico for the location shooting. So we had a, like a pre-production party where everybody met everybody else and had drinks. And uh, Barbara had a boyfriend at that time, and Ringo had a girlfriend. Uh, so they each brought their respective mates. But I think their, their eyes met at the party. And uh, later when we were shooting in Mexico, uh, both their companions came down to visit the set and hang out. But by the end of the film, when we were shooting the uh, seduction scene between the two of them, they had uh, kind of bonded. And we spent a long night rehearsing the uh, the bedroom scene, as we used to call it. And the next morning, they came to the set holding holding hands, and they be, they were an item ever since. And they're still together. You don't hear that much anymore. In, uh... No, and, and, and that's probably because uh, there was a moment in England when they went off the road at high speed in a, in a car, and had a, you know, what could have been a fatal accident. Uh, the car rolled and, you know, 100 yards, it was just a pile of twisted metal, and they walked away. And looked at each other and said, "Wow, I, you know, I guess we were meant to be together for life," and and so they stayed together forever. Yeah, and of course, you mentioned Dennis Quaid playing Lar, who uh, ends up getting his legs in a bit of a tangle there at the beginning of the film. Yep, yep. A lot <laughs> of physicality. Has a uh, uh, unfortunate incident with a giant mosquito. That's the biggest laugh in the movie. <laughs> what was that made out of? You know. Uh, it was fabricated out of, you know, plastic and, and uh, a little engine that word made. The, it looked like a big dragonfly. Yep. Uh, it was like a combination dragonfly, blood-sucking mosquito. <laughs> and, uh, and it was made, you know, almost like you, you would make a, uh, a model for a museum of, you know, here's what a fly looks like, you know, blown up a hundred times. Uh, and it was very carefully fabricated. We had a few of them because we knew they'd be smashed. Yeah. And uh, we were able to fill it with, you know, goo. <laughs> yeah. Another another Roy Arbogast creation. And uh, it it was a. You know, I, I, for people who are going to revisit the movie. As a result of listening to us, I don't want to give away the joke. But nope. Mosquito nope. is funny. Yeah, the mosquito is great. It's a great sound effect to it, too. Yep. And, of course, Shelley Long went on to a long, uh, 
uh, run on Cheers, and of course she plays Tala. She was a gifted comedian. Yep. About it. Yeah, she's the one that dares go back to that the cave of Tonda because she wants Lana out of there, you know, and (laughs) goes and pulls that that, uh, crab arm off of Tonda's nose. I like that little touch. And, of course, uh, John, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Matuzak. Matuzak. Yeah, he's famous for Goonies, but to me, I'm always going to remember him as playing Tonda. And I love those scenes, two, twice in the movie, where he threatens uh, uh, a toque with a giant rock. And one time, of course, he falls backwards. I like the one where he goes forward without letting it go. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, 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 he played a guy who was, you know, more muscle than brains. And he represented that whole, you know, physical element of evolution where, you know, only the strong survive. And the, uh, the movie is actually about, no, it's not only the strong who survive, it's also the clever and the smart. And we owe our existence to all those uh, proto-humans who figured things out for themselves, how to stand straight, how to make fire, how to like, use weapons. Like a toque. Yeah, like a toque. Yeah. That's, and, that's the real answer. Those are our real ancestors. And I gotta say too, I think one of the most inspiring casting in the movie. And again, I forget this guy's last name. A- Avery. Avery Schreiber. I gotta say, like he's got the facial reactions. Like he looks like the caveman. And I'm gonna tell you, to me, in my personal opinion, the f- scene that makes me laugh the hardest is where um, they're being f- uh, f- uh, fended off when uh, by the good cavemen with the torches, and one of them flashes it right across his hind quarters, and he's running off, and he's letting out a terrible farting gas, and his leg... And because of the fire, the wind is, you know, he's, he's lighting his farts as he runs. And it sounds like, not only does it sound like a motorcycle, but if you watch him go, his one leg is shaking as he's going, it's like he's starting a motorcycle. Yeah, no, no. He, it, it, it's, uh, he was a very, very funny physical comedian. Uh, he had a long run on television. He was in a lot of commercials. He was the Frito Bandito for many years. He yeah. used to play ethnic parts. And he, he was a, partners, a comedy partner with a guy named Jack Burns. They had a team called Burns and Schreiber. They did, uh, and he did a television show with... Dick Van Dyke called my mother the car. He was he was a very funny guy. He left too early. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know he was in a movie called Cannonball too, where he had a little bit of a comedic part in that. Yep, yep. But yeah, he had he had, he had a good run as a as a comic actor. He started in Second City. He's another impro- a lot a lot of people in that movie were improvisational actors. I knew uh, who could uh, be counted on to create funny business for themselves. What I liked about Avery is even when he's not focused on, he's always doing something. Like his reactions, like like to me, Caveman, like you just I just picture his face, you know, like mm-hmm. just his react that, that was great casting getting him. Yeah, no, I I, I was uh, um, you know I, I knew he could do the job and I knew he was funny and I didn't have any opposition casting him so you know it, it worked out great i was able to use a lot of people whose whose work i knew or during our casting sessions i was became convinced that they were the right person who was the fellow that got his uh speaking of the torch scene got his uh half his hair and eyebrows burned off the other henchman uh oh the the real primitive looking guy yeah remember when the the torch yeah, goes uh, uh, He's a Mexican actor and stuntman that we found in Mexico. Yeah. He, uh, he had these very strong features that looked prehistoric. I mean, the guy looks like an Inca statue. Okay. An Aztec statue. Um, oh, God, what was his name? Um, uh, oh, well. I don't recall his name offhand, but he, he, was a three, he was a local actor. He was somebody we found in Mexico. Because we, we had to cast... We were... Uh, technically a Mexican American co production. Yeah. Uh, so that we, there were certain quotas we had to use. We had to use a certain number of uh, Mexican crew and the second camera 
people and actors and extras. And we were lucky to find some very talented people uh, there who, who uh, contributed to the picture. And you had, there's a, a couple of people I got to mention too. Um, uh, Cork Hobart, who played, of course, Ta, unfortunately no longer with us either. Of course, he was the smallest one who ends up when they yeah. set the big egg down, they end up setting it on him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Evan Kim, who was... Uh, yeah, I liked him. He was yeah. brilliant in Kentucky Fried Movie. That, yes, he was, yeah. That long uh, Bruce Lee parody that was so terrific. Yeah, Evan Kim, of course, the one who speaks uh, uh, English in the film. Why Why did you have him speak English? What, like... he, was the, uh, he was the most obvious foreigner. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, yeah. But I was wondering if, that, like, uh, when you were writing the script, whether... There was something that you needed to translate, you know, or wh- whether that was just you just put that in for the fun of it. Oh, that was just for the fun of it, and uh, and it made sense to have him say the line. Yeah, no, you had a great cast in that film, but you know, I think most people really, and no, this is nothing against the cast, but but most people remember the silly dinosaurs, and I love the di- and I, I'm going to say this, my brothers. My two brothers have said this, too. I mean, you had the same two dinosaurs, but I often said those dinosaurs were, not only were they not very bright, I believe they were the same dinosaurs, just not smart enough to take the hint. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I love them. those. The creatures were uh, a guy named uh, Jim Danforth and David, uh, God, it's been so long, I don't know. Normally, I would have you know IMDb open to that page, and I could just read off the names to you. But I, I didn't didn't do my prep. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the, the special effects guys uh, created those creatures and made them so that they could be threatening at, at one level, but also made them so that you could uh, uh, you know that they were they could be funny. I mean, like when when the uh, the creature goes off the qu- uh, the cliff. Oh, that was fantastic! <laughs> I I, uh, I you know acted I acted it out. I mimed the the dinosaur part. I yeah. I want him to do this. I and liked sure it. Enough, yeah. When they animated him, that's exactly what they did. Yeah, the Tyrannosaurus Rex yeah, coming up, sneaking. He's just sneaking behind them, you know. Yeah. And then Ringo Starr stops there, and he's thinking, and he goes. And you got the creature, the tongue licking across his mouth, and he's rubbing his little hands together, and Ringo's like, nah. And then the thing, the thing growls like it's offended. You know? and, and when it does go over the cliff, like, I love the payoff to that scene. It was, it's yeah. one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Yeah, it worked great. I, uh, uh, it, was, it was also, you know, the fact that he got, you know, he got high. <laughs> yep. And, of course, he has a, a very funny moment, too, with Jack Guilford, who at first, you know, you know, Jack Guilford, of course, playing the blind caveman, the father to uh, yeah. Tala. You know, I like it when he's wandering up by himself and the shadows over him and he, he kind of, his head kind of knocks into this hard surface and then there's cuts to that wide shot, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, and he's kind of rubbing its belly and <laughs> It's, it's tongues out. It's like this feels good, and then he yeah. whacks it with a stick. Yeah, that was uh, David Allen was uh, was the guy who helped create that, and also a guy named Peter Kleinow, uh, whose nickname was Sneaky Pete. Okay, and he was a great slide guitar player who played on Grateful Dead albums and had a career, a second career as a. Uh, as a musician, a uh, uh, very well-respected musician. And let's not forget the campfire scene. That T-Rex, boy, <laughs> he was shaking his foot off bad when he retreated on that one. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Stuff like that was very fun. And, of course, there's that other dinosaur, too, with the that you see in the opening, of course. And I loved it when they're throwing the rocks at him and it kind yeah. of conks him on the head. And you see the eyes just going all over the place. Yeah. But R- R- Ringo Starr, of course, uh, being the brains of the group, you know, and he, at one point throwing that pumpkin and it just lands on its horn. I, I love the effect where where it's kind of cross-eyed there trying to deal with that pumpkin. And you, that was a nice effect there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, 
Jim Danforth doesn't get any on-screen credit, but he he actually you know made the the models and did the renderings for the creatures. So I I the 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 best of the the if everything you liked about the creatures was uh, Jim Danforth and David Allen working together. Yeah, and of course, you know, uh, I, I can't believe Steven Spielberg didn't seek these creatures out for Jurassic Park, huh? <laughs> 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 but no, um, then of course you get the pterodactyl. You, I, I liked it too when they're carrying that egg and you just, you, you, you know, uh, you get that sound, that swish sound of the pterodactyl and you got um, Tonda kind of looks at the group and it's like, you know what, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I liked it too because when it was swooping at him with the mouth out, gaped open, you you had some terrific shots there. Yeah, no, no, there, I, uh, uh, I was, uh, as a director, I was very happy with, you know, the art department and the creatures and the effects photography. They, they, they all got it right. Everybody did a great job. I, you know, I, I have to credit collaborators because movies are a collaborative art form, and, and uh, everybody, everybody did their job. The dinosaurs in that film even, even did uh, wake up and, uh, and night calls as well. <laughs> like the moon would go, go come up, and you hear the hooting sound coming up of a dinosaur. And yeah. then in the morning, it's a rooster sound, that stuff like that. Little touches like that were funny. And, of course, we have a nearby ice age in that film as well, where Richard uh, Mole, a uh, future uh, night court. I can't hang on. Uh, there's uh, this call waiting feature, so I'm gonna uh, come, go offline and come back just for a second. Don't go away. Sure, I'll just pause this. Please. Yeah, Richard Mole playing the uh, the abominable snowman, you know, and <laughs> oh man, uh, t t tell me about that. Uh, about. about about, what? about casting Richard Mole to play the oh, abominable. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we needed somebody. Huge, you know. Richard Mall is like six foot. Uh, Richard Mall was like when we were casting uh, Tanda. Richard Mall was the uh, you know the the, the runner-up to Matuzak. Okay. Because he was six foot six and very intimidating. If you remember him on Night Court when he played Bull the Bailiff. Yep. He was a big, impressive guy. Uh, but Matuzak really had the muscles. I mean, Richard is a big, tall guy well built but he didn't have that incredible musculature he couldn't rip a a, a dinosaur leg into uh <laughs> yeah I mean, you know, he, he uh you know matuzak was an extraordinary human being yeah to see him up close was you, you realized what our species is capable of i mean he was like six foot eight weighed about 270 260 he could run you know he, he could run he was a linebacker for the oakland raiders and he could run he could run, he could kick. I mean, he was he was the real deal. We were very lucky to get him. But Richard was runner up. And we wanted, you know, we wanted the 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 abominable snowman to be big and terrifying, and we didn't want to do it as an animation. We wanted to film that scene live. So, uh, you know, we built the uh, the Yeti costume and put Richard in it. And uh uh he worked out great, he was, and he was funny because he was a comedian and he had a comic actor's instincts. He, he wasn't just a guy inhabiting the suit; he made the guy funny. That that final part, and I won't give this away, but the payoff on that last scene with the the abominable snowman is so funny. It's like you know, not so vicious after all. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed that he disappointed he didn't get dinner. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, th this this movie, like I said, it, I, I've got it on Blu-ray home. I was a little disappointed that it only had the theatrical trailer. I wish there was a little uh, some extras on it. You know, in in those days, they didn't they didn't do much. Did you ever think about doing like a, a, a commentary track on it? If anybody asks me, I'm happy to do it. But you know, it. it uh, it's been reissued. I don't know if they're. Gonna, I don't know if they 
did they get, put it out on Blu-ray? Yeah, I've got it. I ordered it okay, online, so yeah. It's out there, but it's one of those ones that, you know, they had it in the library. It was United Artists' picture, and United Artists as a studio, you know, was, went through difficult times and had a reorganization. So, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of cloudy uh, rights situation, and, and uh, you know, nobody... You know, nobody took the time to do it. Yeah, because I, I I think the the movie's very 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 clever. Uh, was, there, was there anything in it that you found in, uh, um, in, uh, particularly challenging to film? Oh, let me think. Uh, no, the the hard part was trying to imagine what the finished film would look like because we didn't have dinosaurs or you know it's all stop motion with miniatures so when you're doing the scene when they're running from the creature or when Ringo is riding on the back of the creature yeah these are all you know clever optical effects uh, and actually very primitive by today's standards I still think they they work, especially from the humor standpoint, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the, the, so when we were filming those scenes, I had to rely on Jim Danforth and David Allen, and the actors had to rely on them because they would basically hold up a broom and say, okay, this is the dinosaur. Look at it. Now run away. Now look back. Now look again. Uh, and, and it was... Uh, it was tough because you were basically acting with nothing but air. And one of those great shots too was like near the be- like at the beginning where they're all up in that tree and and uh, I like it because um, Avery is face uh, his back is to the creature and you know the the creature goes up there on the tree he's not quite able to reach them you know but I love Avery's reaction like he really uh, he really got it. Yeah. Yeah. But I gotta say this though, um, you did the jerk before that, and I gotta say you did a lot of hilarious stuff. Of course, you played Iron Balls McGinty in the Jerk. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I gotta say, um, in in writing the Jerk, what was it like working with Steve Martin? Well, we you know, we had worked a lot together. Uh, we had been. On, on the Smothers show and on, on the Glenn Campbell show. Uh, so we had written a lot of comedy together. Uh, he was a new young comic, and uh, I, I, I was, when we met, we were both performers. We weren't writers. We were you know, comedians. I was in an improvisational comedy group, and he was, uh, you know, as, as he used to say, just another comedy magic banjo act. Yeah, and he's still working his magic. And I'm gonna tell you, um, there was a, a, a scene in uh, the Jerk that I, I still laugh at to this day. It's when he's hooked up with uh, Caitlin Adams, and they're up. Of course, we we see earlier, you know, he's all excited because he's got his name in the phone book, you yeah. know, and he in uh, Caitlin Adams has him up there in the uh, the. Uh, the mu- yeah, an amusement park ride there, and you see they're rocking back and forth. You know they're having it out, and uh, and he goes, "Wow, you got my name tattooed right on your leg, right next to, or no, right on your your ass, right next to the date." You know, I bet first I got my name in the phone book. Now it's on your ass. I bet more people see that than the phone book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that still that still gets me to this day. You know, and. The, the simplicity of his character and that he feels so different because, you know, his, his, uh, the family that took him in was black, but they loved him like one of their own, you know, and uh, yeah, and I thought that was a nice touch to the movie and ha- he had to go find himself and, and uh, y- you know, it, not just Steve Martin, like, like, like uh, Jackie Mason was in that as well, another great comic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we wanted to do more with Jackie, but he, at that point in his career, he was very full of himself. Oh, and uh, you know, uh, he had some bimbo that he wanted to play his wife. Okay. We had to hire her just to make him happy. 
but uh, uh, so we we didn't get to use him as much as as we wanted to. Uh, but he you know he was a good comedian and you know he was right for the part so uh, it all worked out in the end. And of course, uh, uh, M M M Walsh. Yes. Uh, wonderful in the film. I liked it how he's, you know, just draws out the points in the phone book. He's having just a bad day. And it's like he's going to shoot somebody. And, and of course, Steve Martin's character just doesn't get it. He starts shooting at him at the gas station. He's yep. hitting these oil cans. He goes, Steve Martin goes, he hates these cans. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, where do you come up with uh, stuff like that? Because... Uh, this is some great comic uh, writing. Well, you know, I, again, you know, there's, there's uh, besides me and Steve, there was a very gifted comic writer named Michael Elias who worked on that script and did a lot of the jokes. And Carl Reiner is no slouch. Oh, Carl's great, yeah. In comedy. So it was, uh, you know, I, I, I can't take sol- solo credit for almost, you know, anything in the movie because it was a result of collaboration. You know, we all worked together to make the funniest movie we could. And uh, as often happens, uh, it worked out. And, you know, more often it doesn't work and you have, you know, you have a failed effort. And with comedy, you know, when it fails, it really fails because it's just not funny. Nobody laughs. Uh, But, uh, you know, it was a lot of good people doing a lot of good work, so I'm thrilled to have been a part of it. And of course, Carl Reiner makes a, an appearance in it playing himself, gone cockeyed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, an, another person, too, like I thought another inspired casting in The Jerk was Bernadette Peters. Oh, well, she was, uh, she was Steve's girlfriend at the time. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, they, were, they, were, they went together for years. Well, they did do, uh, what was it, Pennies from Heaven together? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 She was a, a fabulous talent. I loved her. Oh, she was great. She had, She's still great. She had that voice. I love that scene where, uh, you know, she's going to leave, and, of uh, course, <laughs> Steve can't understand the note because he's trying to read it off because he's got his wet hands all over it. He picks a dog up, and he's going out, outside to find find her. They, she ha- he has to grab some uh, bystander's little poodle or whatnot and stick it down by his hind quarters yeah. to try to block himself up. Um how how did Steve get himself mentally prepared to do a scene like that? You know, uh, I wasn't there when we filmed it. Oh, okay. But uh, you know, uh, you have to trust the director to to you know protect you. And I guess they, you know, I don't think he was really 100 percent nude. He was probably wearing a g-string or, or something. It but, was. Uh, 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 the illusion was perfect. So. <laughs> For all I know, he was naked under that dog. And of course, the one film out there where somebody's got a dog named Shit. (laughs) Yeah. And again, Caitlin Adams was great casting as well. Yeah, she was terrific. Yeah. No, I I love The Jerk. I, I think to this day, I think it's, in my opinion, I still think it's the funniest movie that Steve Martin had done. And it was a tremendous hit. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. A, it was a great hit. So, how much of the writing, um, did, like, did you do on that film? Like, what, what, uh, what are the jokes in that film that uh, you wrote? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't on films on which I've collaborated. Uh, I've always. I, this goes back to variety television when you know. A, Ten of us would be pitching jokes in a writer's room. Okay. There were guys, and this is a bit of a digression, but allow me. Um, there were guys in the writer's room who would watch the show, you know, after, after the whole process. You know, we'd pitch the, the jokes and the sketches in the writer's room, then we'd go off and write them, then the boys would rehearse them. Uh, the guests would come in, and they would re- rehearse, and then we'd perform and, and shoot, the, uh, shoot it for live television. Uh, or tape it for later broadcast. And there were guys 
who all through that process would be like very protective of their material. And when the show would air, they'd sit there and we'd watch it in the green room and they'd say, that's my line. That's my line. That's mine. I wrote that. And sometimes they didn't write that. Okay. But that obsession with, oh, that's mine. Oh, that's mine. No, it's not yours. It belongs to the show. It belongs to the actors who are saying the words. And they're the ones who are getting the laughs, not you. So, you know, chill out. You know, let, let the collaborative process work. Don't be so in such a hurry to identify with all the material. Uh, so that, that, and also my background in improvisational comedy, where, where you're really dependent on the give and take with your other actors on stage, you know, you can't claim authorship of every line. You can, even if you're the first one to say it on stage, you wouldn't have said it if, you, if the other actors hadn't set you up. So I'm very, very conscious of the collaborative nature of comedy. Okay. So I don't take credit for individual jokes or lines. You know, sometimes they were mine, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they came about because somebody else said something funny, and I said, oh, wait, let me, you know, ch tweak that a little bit and make it work. It's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. So uh, I, the thing I will take credit for is that moment... Uh, when Steve and I were in the writer's room, in a writer's office, Steve had a writing contract at Paramount and asked me to collaborate with him. And they said, okay, and they hired me to write with Steve. And we sat there not knowing what we were going to write about. We had, you know, we had a, what, you know, a, a blind script deal, which meant that they were going to pay us to write a script, whether, you know, whether they liked it or not. Uh, they were betting on Steve, and he was betting on that he and I could come up with something. So for two weeks, we couldn't figure out what it was we were going to write. And then we just come into work and sit there at a typewriter looking at each other and going, what if, and, you know, nothing was clicking. And then one day Steve said, you know, there's a line in my act that I've been doing for years that always gets a big laugh, even if I'm not succeeding, if it's a bad room or you know, an off night, this line always works. I said, well, what is it? And he said, I was born a poor black child. Okay, yeah. And as he said that, I don't know, you know, like something clicked in the room. And it wasn't me and it wasn't him. It was like the collaboration. We looked at each other and basically said, well, what if you were? <laughs> then what would happen? And that was the premise of the whole, you know, opening of the movie. He was born a poor black child, and he grew up, and then he had to, you know, have to face that moment uh, as a, as an adopted orphan child, where he, you know, learns that his heritage is not the same as the family that he grew up in. And we did that by, you know, hearing some particularly, you know, white dance band music, you know, which was so different from the black African-American blues experience that Steve should have enjoyed, or the char Naven, the character should have enjoyed. Uh, and then he realizes, oh, my God, you know, these are, this is the music of my people. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, when he decides to leave home and find, find his future. Yeah, and, and you played, of course, Iron Balls McGinty. Now, um, how did you come apart uh, to do that part? Well, you know, I, I had written the film, and I had come around to watch different shooting days. And, and on that day, they needed three, three big burly, you know, three big guys to play gangsters. Uh, so we were kind of undifferentiated. It was me. Lenny Montana, who was famous for doing Godfather, he played Luca Brasi in The Godfather, and a, a famous uh, stunt guy, Gene something. Uh, and so we were just playing undifferentiated bad guys who talked derogatively about African Americans, and then Steve says, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an 
black person. And there's a fight, and the culmination of the fight is when he kicks me in the groin, and there's a clank. <laughs> yeah. And you cut to him and, and Bernadette Peters in the restaurant, and she says, uh, you know, don't be so upset, honey. You know, you, you had no idea that that was Iron Balls McGinty. <laughs> so the the joke came, you know, after the fact. I wasn't, that wasn't my name when we filmed the scene. I was just like, you know, heavy number two, uh, you know, bad guy number two. Uh, and they found that joke, in, that, that line was written later, uh, and then that became the character's name, and that was me. But I, you know, when I started the movie and when that part was written, there was no Iron Balls McGinty. Oh, wow. And, of course, you know, we had mentioned earlier you, uh, you worked with Steven Spielberg with Jaws, and uh, you played, of course, a character named Meadows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jaws, I, I know, is uh, probably the... Would you? That's the biggest uh, film you worked on, is that right? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Because um, I know you've worked as director, I know you've worked as a writer, and you've starred in a few movies as well. Um what are your stories uh, um, on the set of uh, Jaws? Well, for that, I would refer all your listeners or anybody who comes across this. Uh, I have to recommend a book that I wrote called The Jaws Log, uh, available at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and everywhere books are sold. It's the best-selling book about the making of a movie ever written. And I wrote it, and it's all about the making of Jaws. And I even got to revisit it. It came out when the movie came out and was the best-selling book about a movie ever written. And then 25, on the 25th anniversary edition, we, it was reissued because it had been such a success. It was reissued, and I got to revisit a lot of the things and, and add some end notes stuff that I found out after I wrote the book, stuff that nobody wanted in the book the first time. But on the second go-round, I was able to include a lot of new material, and that all wound up in the book. So for Jaws stories, I would suggest you go read the Jaws log. Yeah. Um... I'm going to tell you is basically just me repeating what's in the book. Okay. Well, Jaws is a fan. Ask me about. Yeah, if you have a specific question, I'd be happy to answer it. Well, J- Jaws, I, I've seen that uh, screened a few times. Fantastic movie. Love the opening. Yeah. Uh, very scary opening and uh, great cast in it. You know, I mean, er, um, uh, Richard Dreyfuss after fresh after American Graffiti, um, and uh, of course uh, Roy uh, Scheider, uh, also great in the film. Uh, what was it like uh, working with uh, with them? It was great. I mean, they uh, 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 the thing of the thing about uh, Jaws and, uh, and the Jerk and Caveman and um, the movies that I'm most proud of were movies in which everybody's ego was in control. Nobody had a runaway ego. Nobody wanted to be the big star. Uh, everybody concentrated on making the best movie possible. Everybody was trying to do their job. And as it turned out, including Steven Spielberg, who was a very young and untested director. Uh, but everybody, and you know, it's, it's an accident when it happens. You can't plan it. I mean, nobody sets out to make a bad movie. Uh, good movie works. It it works uh, because everybody did their best, and it came together. And in terms of coming together, Jaws was especially fortunate because the editor won an Academy Award for editing that movie, and John Williams won an Academy Award for scoring it. So it was like great sound, great editing, great cinematography. Uh, I like to think the dialogue and the plot was was good because I that's that was my job. Uh, my character was I thought presentable. Uh, 
so I think the success of Jaws is because everybody was doing their best, and, you know, including Shaw and Scheider and Dreyfus. Everybody was a little frustrated at times, and Shaw and Scheider and Dreyfus, you know, were incredibly frustrated because they had to spend two months going out on a boat every day to get the shark footage. And, and that, wasn't, that wasn't fun. They'd be out in the sun all day long, you know, 12 hours of daylight, and they were lucky if they got 20 seconds of film to show for it. Of course, you went on also uh, to write uh, Jaws 2 and Jaws 3D. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I became uh, the go-to rewrite guy. Oh, my God, the script's in trouble. We can't shoot what we have. Get Carl. So that's what happened. What did you think of uh, Jaws 2 and Jaws 3? What's that? What did you think of Jaws 2 and Jaws 3? Because obviously, you know, they're not quite the masterpiece well, that know, Jaws they, is. No, of course they're not. But, you no. know, that, that's, that's true. Uh, with the possible exception of The Godfather, there have been very few films that the sequel lived up to the promise of the original. Uh, and before The Godfather, you've got to remember, Jaws 2 was the most successful sequel of all, of all time. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in Jaws 2. Uh, it, it's a serviceable story about kids in trouble and a big a big bad shark and with two you don't you don't have the luxury of you know not knowing what the shark looks like because everybody's seen the movie you know the first one so we couldn't hold back on the shark like we did uh so uh i was a writer for hire you know they they started both pictures jaws 2 and jaws 3 they started without me they thought they could do it with a different writer and a different director, they you know they they definitely weren't going to get Spielberg back, but the studio was too valuable a property. I mean, a picture grosses you know a billion dollars. You're not going to let it just lay there. You're going to do it again. They didn't get Richard Dreyfus back either. Well, they, they 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 all the the only reason they got Scheider is because uh, they had him in a contract. He agreed to do a sequel. You know when he made the first movie never thinking that they would actually ask him to do it, and then he couldn't say no, contractually. Yeah. So, and, of course, you know, everybody else, you know, just was... Uh, Lorraine Gary, you know, of course she, she was there. She was married to the head of the studio. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, they got into trouble. They fired the director. They canned the script they had, and they asked me, could I work on, again, two or three weeks' notice and, and fix it? And I'm kind of proud that I did. Same with Jaws 3D. They started without me. Um, a very famous writer started on that script. Richard Matheson wrote one of the early drafts of Jaws 3D. Okay. Uh, but it, it wasn't working. So I got hired and did what I could. Yeah, I'm looking over your credits here, you worked with uh, Richard Pryor and uh, Which Way Is Up. Uh huh. Wow, I, I I I loved him growing up. What was he like to work with? Uh, difficult. Okay. But very funny, and uh, he he had you know he was kind of bipolar. If 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 you caught him during a healthy period, and that was. When we were making Which Way Is Up, he was dating uh, a wonderful actress named Pam Greer. Okay, yep. He was uh, basically making sure that he ate right and didn't drink and do drugs and just concentrated on his work. And uh, So we had a great time writing the movie. He was attached, and I was hired to rewrite, a, again, to rewrite a script that wasn't working well. And... Uh, I got to work a lot with closely with Richard, and when he was uh, healthy, he was great. And before that, I had worked with him uh, two years earlier. I had worked with him on a Flip Wilson special, on two two Flip Wilson specials on NBC, when he was going through his drugs and alcohol stage, and he was you know unpredictable and uncontrollable. He got into a fist fight with an NBC 
staff in person, uh, you know, he, he could be difficult. But we always got along, first of all, because I knew him from the comedy days when he was just a stand-up, you know, a, a little-known stand-up comedian. You know, I had seen him work. He had seen me work. You know, we knew each other's comedy roots and respected them. And, and uh, uh, we got along well when we were writing the movie. So, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a, one of those collaborations that worked that worked. I've been very lucky in the people that I've worked with. Yeah. Yeah, and another comedian you worked with as well, actually right after Caveman, you uh, uh, wrote Dr. Detroit with Dan Aykroyd. I had the pleasure of meeting Dan Aykroyd. Uh, well, I'd say a, about... He's a fellow Pepsi, isn't he? Yeah. He, he, um, he um, about 10 years ago, was signing... Uh, um, he he had his own brand of wine, and he was at the the uh, New Brunswick Liquor here in town. And uh, I had him sign my copy of the Blues Brothers, and uh, I had my picture taken with him. Great guy, I I really enjoyed meeting him. And of course, I think Doctor Detroit. I correct me if I'm wrong. Was that the first thing you wrote after Caveman? Uh, he just see, Caveman was eighty one. And uh, this was '83. Doctor Detroit. I, it was it's kind of a toss-up between Doctor Detroit and Jaws 3D. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't. I'd have to go back and figure it out. They were released very cl- within a year of each other, and I wrote. I wrote on both those movies during 1983. I think '82 and '83. And I, you know, I, I couldn't tell you. A Caveman was '81. 80, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and and yeah, I think the Doctor Detroit came first, and then uh, then Jaws three. Yeah, that was just after the unfortunate passing of uh, John Belushi. And, oh, yeah, uh, no, it, it, it was, and it was a, it was kind of cathartic for Danny to go back to work as soon as he could. Yeah, and yeah. then of course once again, the the Gottlieb knack for bringing actors together. Uh, it was on the set of Dr. Detroit that Danny met Donna Dixon, uh, who he later married, and to whom he is still married. Yeah, and he also still uh, good friends with Fran Drescher, who was also in that movie as well. Yeah, he was very funny. Yeah. So y- you uh, you do well, of course, write, writing uh, serious uh, suspense stuff like Jaws, and uh, but you do also do fantastic uh, comedic work as well. Uh, which, which do you... If you had a preference, which do you prefer? Um, in terms of the difficulty of the work, I prefer drama because it's simpler. In terms of the, the payoff and, and the satisfaction, I prefer comedy because it's much harder to do. And when you do it right, you can hear it in the movie theater. You can hear the laughs and go, okay, got it right. You know, this, you can't argue if they're laughing. You can't say it's not effective. So comedy gives you the most uh, positive feedback uh, and, and is harder to do. I mean, there's a famous, famous joke. It's attributed to many people. I think originally there was an actor named Monty Woolley who was a, uh, a character actor. He was in The Man Who Came to Dinner, and he was in uh, uh, Miracle on 34th Street, old you know, 1940s Hollywood films. Okay. And he did both comedies and dramas, and he was uh, he was sick and he was he was dying, and somebody came to visit him in the hospital, and was being you know solicitous and Monty was in, you know in, in bad shape and he leaned over the hospital bed and he said uh, you know I'm, I'm so sorry is is this I'm so sorry it's this hard for you, and Monty said uh, dying is easy. Comedy is hard, <laughs> uh, which, which which kind of sums it up. Uh, so, in you know, drama is is easy. Comedy is hard. Now, uh, did you? I'm, I'm assuming you must have attended um, some screenings of these, like the premiere. Right. Was there any specific comedy you've done that really had? Uh, um, uh, that you have any stories about the reactions of people around, around you, the payoff? Um, 
interestingly enough, uh, the, the most uh, interesting one was um, when we were preparing the jerk. Okay. Paramount financed a short film for Steve Martin to introduce him to movie audiences, and we made a short called The Absent-Minded Waiter. Okay. Which was nominated for an Academy Award in 1976, I think, as the uh, uh, best live-action short film. And it was a it was a very funny comedy, and I directed it, and uh, from a script that Steve wrote. And it was only seven or eight minutes long, but it was so great to see it in front of an audience when you see these jokes that you had planned so carefully and tried to shoot correctly. Uh, they work. You know, an audience laughed. And the short film, you know, there's no market for short films, but Steve got the possession of the film. He owned it as a result of our settlement with Paramount Pictures over the script for The Jerk. Because The Jerk was written for Paramount, but re produced and released by Universal, because Paramount didn't think Steve was a star. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so, uh, um, so Steve, when he got that short, he used to use it in his act when he was doing concert tours. Okay. He, he, uh, he would have an opening act. A lot of times it was Steve Goodman, a wonderful singer, songwriter. And then Steve would do the first act. Then the second act would open with a short film. They would project that for seven or eight minutes. 10 minutes, I think. And then Steve would come out and do the, the next 50 minutes and, you know, be a colossal hit. And I've seen that film, you know, in in concert, so to speak. And it just, you know, it's just very exciting to see your planning uh, come true. And you see the last that you planned come out. So there you are. Well, you know, Carl, you've had a, a, pretty, a really impressive career, and I'm going to tell you, um, I, I, I think it's uh, greatly humble where you, where you mention yourself as a collaborative, you know, and you give credit to the people that you work with, but, you know, um, I, I got to say, too, even as a director, like, uh, like with Caveman, like... Um, what was uh, I don't know whether Caveman was the first film you directed or not. It was. Oh, was it? What was it like? Yeah, go the Absent Minded Waiter was the first film I directed, but that was a short film. Okay. Well, what was it like going from? I know you wrote Caveman, but what was it like taking the rings and directing? Like, why did you direct Caveman? Well, that was my deal. I mean, you know, they, they, when I wrote it, uh, I said, you know. If this film gets made, I want to be the director. Okay. Well, you were the right choice. Yeah. Well, no. Contractually, they, if they made the movie, they had to use me as director. Uh, and it was uh, a source of some friction between me and Rudy DeLuca, because I think his agents had promised him that he, if the film, the script was successful, he would direct it. But that wasn't in his deal. It was in my deal. Okay. Uh, so when, when we got the green light, I called Rudy and said, great news, they're going to make our movie, because by that time we had been partners in writing it. Okay. And, you know, great news, they're going to make the movie and I'm going to direct. And there was this, like, like icy silence on the other end of the line. And I said, well, what's the matter? He said, well, I thought we would direct it together. And I said, gee, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, I don't think it's a good idea to direct for a film to have two directors and it's only like it was after that that the Cohen brothers got to make their own movies but uh, I said no you know I you know no I think I'm gonna direct it by myself and he you know he was very unhappy well, that's unfortunate did you did you find uh, stepping in as director um, a challenge or did you just uh, you know uh, well, you know, I, I I was not new to the business. I, I you know I knew what a camera was. I knew how to stage actors. It, well, you know, there's a lot of mystique about directing, but uh, you know if if you're surrounded with good people, if you have a good editor and a good uh, a, a good assistant director, and you have 
good visual effects people and a good cinematographer uh, who's been with you know, you know made a lot of movies. It's a team, you know. If you if you got the right team, it's you know it's not hard to win the World Series if you got a great team. Yeah. So uh, there was a good. I had. A, I knew I had a good team. I was very confident of them. Uh, so uh, it it went well. I, you know, I wasn't. And and the whole secret is, is when you when you're doing something, it may be like the first time you've done it, but you've done stuff like it before, and if you approach even a difficult job with saying to yourself, all right, I've done this before, I can do this again, that's what I did. Wow. Well, so, you know what? You, you've done it all, even playing a priest in, uh, and clueless, I yep. see, you know? <laughs> um, d- so, uh, yeah, yeah, you've acted, you've uh, written, and you've directed. Do you have a preference that you like in all, all those? Well, the, the preference is for acting, because in terms of physical effort, that's the easiest thing. You just show up, you, know, you get dressed in the outfit, go out, say your words, go back and relax until the next take. You don't have to worry about the entire script. You don't have to worry about the production. You don't have to worry about, is your leading lady going to be a problem? You don't have to worry about, are we going to lose the lights before we get the shot? Uh, you know, all the problems that you have as a director or a producer uh, don't exist. And as a writer, you know, you, the, the, by the time you're an actor, the script's already written. All you have to do is say the words that are there. Or if they're words that you wrote, you can, you can change them and make them better. Uh, so acting is the easiest. Writing is the hardest. Directing is the most fun if I can sum it up. And the reason directing is the most fun is because the way Hollywood is structured, the director is God King and everybody does what you say. Yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed uh, chatting with you tonight. I've, um, I gotta say, like, uh, out of all the movies that, uh, that you've been part of, do you have a personal favorite? No. No. Well, I mean, the, uh, it's like uh, you know. It's like asking a person which 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 of your kids do you like the most. <laughs> well, probably we were all your children. You know, you you you. Uh, they were all difficult to give birth to, so the fact that they exist is uh, is uh, that makes me happy. Well, you know what? I find it hard to pick too. You know, I I I, I think you've got a great body of work, and uh, I've really enjoyed uh, talking about your films tonight. And it's really nice to talk caveman because you know, like I said, you you don't get to to hear enough about it, and uh, it brings back some uh, childhood memories for me. I would have been nine years old when that was released, and and to think this is perfect because uh, it was released in April of 1981, and here we are in April. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was April seventeenth, nineteen eighty-one. Here we are, April thirteenth. So almost on the or on the dot. Thirty. What is it? That would be thirty-six years, right? Yep, thirty-six years. Do you? Uh, me- yeah. Do you remember much about the premiere for Caveman? No. No. <laughs> no. I know uh, Ring- Ringo and Barbara were late. Uh, well, you, you know, uh, they're they're involved, so <laughs> that, that that is bound to happen. But uh, that that was a, a great thing that came out of that too. They they found each other and they've maintained maintained the relationship. So you know, kudos to them on that. Well, Carl, I gotta say it's been an honor to talk to you tonight. I, I definitely want to thank uh, Stephen Joyner for for hooking us up and. Uh, and uh, allowing me this honor to go through uh, all these classic films that you've been involved with. Oh, thank you. Thank you yeah. for allowing me the time. I've, I've been a little long-winded. I hope you can cut this down to a manageable length for the listeners. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do a whole lot of editing unless, unless I need to. I, I think your stories have been fantastic. You know, I've been okay. enjoying hearing them. But... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask, though, before you go, I just wonder if you'd do a plug for my show. Uh, sure. What do you want me to say? Yeah, just, just state your name and um, uh, say you've been listening to uh, my show. It's called Python's Paradise, Python like the snake. 
And of course, my name's Greg Gilbert. And I'm out of New Brunswick, Canada. Hi, this is Carl Gottlieb. I wrote a couple of movies called Jaws and the Jerk. And I'm happy to be on Greg Python's show and urge you to 